This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com slash geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And so I want to give a special thank you to Robert Mullen, who just increased his pledge amount. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 507 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm David Barr Kirtley, author of the book Save Me Please and Other Stories, which is available now on Amazon.com. We had a great conversation about the book back at episode 500. So definitely check that out if you missed it. And today on the show, we'll be discussing season one of the Amazon Prime series, The Wheel of Time, based on the books by Robert Jordan. And we'll be covering everything that happens in season one and how it compares to the books. But we will not be revealing what happens in future books in the series. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got our producer, John Joseph Adams. He's the editor of Lightspeed Magazine and the series editor of the best American science fiction and fantasy, and he's also edited more than 30 other anthologies. His latest project is the anthology Lost Worlds and Mythological Kingdoms from Grim Oak Press. So, John, welcome back. Hey, always good to be here. Then next up, we've got Douglas Cohen, making his 11th appearance on the show. His short fiction appears in Inner Zone, Weird Tales, and Space and Time. And he's also the author of Realms of Fantasy, A Retrospective, which collects detailed blog posts about every issue of Realms of Fantasy magazine, where he worked for six and a half years. Together with John Joseph Adams, he co-edited the anthologies Oz Reimagined and What the Bleep Is That? So, Doug, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back, Dave. And also joining us today is Abby Goldsmith, making her fifth appearance on the show. She's a co-host of the Stories for Nerds podcast, and her short fiction has appeared in Escape Pod and Fantasy Magazine. Her Torth series of space opera novels are available now on Wattpad, where they've racked up over 65,000 reads. So, Abby, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. Okay, so let's start off with Abby and have you tell us about your history reading The Wheel of Time. Oh, well, I mean, I started reading it in college, and um, I think, like, book one kind of didn't hook me fully, but by book two, I got I was addicted, and I just sped through the whole rest of the series, waited for every book to come out, and um, I've reread the series multiple times. Hmm. Yep. So, like three times or like nine times well the first few books probably like five or six times and then the last books only once you know maybe the last three only once okay and have you been in you've been involved on like wheel of time message boards and stuff is my impression yeah i have um what mania and um i've been involved in all kinds of little fan groups here and there and i actually kind of met my husband my husband and i bonded over the wheel of time when we hmm. first met so yeah. so wait say more about that uh well we met online online dating app um but it, like we both it was one of the interests we had both listed um and he's a big reader and we both are big fans of the series so um yeah it was just something we had in common right away mm-hmm. uh and so then how about doug what's your history with wheel of time uh let's see my history i started reading it my freshman year i'll always remember it was a lazy sunday i had nothing Fre- to- freshman year of college or high school no oh high school it was a lazy Sunday. I really had nothing to do. I said, let's pick up this book. It was recommended to me. And I was bored out of my mind to start, you know, and there was, I like I said, I had nothing to do that day. So I was like, all right, I'll keep reading. And I always remember it's right around page 100 in the book when the Trollocs attacked, which was early in episode one, all of a sudden like a switch went off in my head and I just got sucked into that world and I just absorbed it. It was like nothing I had read at the time. Uh, right on to the next one and the next one. And then I remember I was so into it, like Shadow Rising, which was like a thousand pages in paperback or more. <laughs> I remember I just tore through that one in four days. And I, you know, I just kept going and reading it. I, you know, I lost momentum as time went on. I didn't appreciate the later books as much, but I stuck with it. Uh, I only read it once and I was an uber fan for the early books, but I kind of tailed off at the end 
Mm. Uh, like maybe from book eight on, it just wasn't the same for me. But you, you read the whole, you finished, you got all the way to the end. Yes, I did read all of Robert Jordan's books, and then I read the ones that Sanderson co-authored slash finished. And I think you said on Facebook that this was your favorite series, like favorite books at the... It was school, for a time, yes. Um, then I discovered A Game of Thrones in 1996, and Wheel of Time took a backseat to that. And then, like I said, the book started falling off for me, so they just, you know, they went down a few notches. But there was a time for several years where these were my favorite books, bar none. Hmm. Had you read, because I know, Doug, you're a big um, Conan the Barbarian fan. Had you ever read uh, Robert Jordan's, any of his Conan books? I did, and I really didn't think much of them, to be honest. Um, I know, like, some people talked them up. I didn't like them at all, and that made me very hesitant to try Wheel of Time. Uh, But I finally picked it up, and, you know, during those first hundred pages, I'm like, yeah, this isn't a surprise. I mean, I didn't like his Conan books. Why would I like these? But, you know, like I said, once those Trollocs attacked, it sucked me in. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's funny you mentioned Game of Thrones because sort of what happened with me was, you know, I my favorite series uh, in high school was Roger Zelazny's Amber series, which is another sort of epic fantasy, sword and sorcery kind of thing. And then I, I really never found other series that I liked as much as that. And I, I, I tried a bunch of them and... Uh, so at a certain point, I, I kind of gave up on on epic fantasy. Um, and then uh, when I was just out of college, I discovered Game of Thrones. And so then I, lo- you know, I just loved that so much. And so then at that point, I was like, oh, well, maybe I should give epic fantasy another try. You know, mm-hmm. check out some of the series that I maybe missed. And, you know, I, had, I, I distinctly remember one of my friends and maybe in high school reading Eye of the World. Uh, which is the first Wheel of Time book, um, but I never I never read it back then. So I, I went back and gave it a try, and um, you know, just in comparison to Game of Thrones, I just it just didn't stand up mm. at all, in my opinion. Uh, so I read the first book and I was like, eh, this is all right, but it, it felt very sort of like sort of dated by that point, sort of generic. Um, and so I just sort of stuck with with Game of Thrones and got really into that. Uh, so I've still I've only ever read the first book of Wheel of Time. And so going into the show, I had kind of, you know, kind of low expectations because of that. Um, but then how about John, too? What's your history with Wheel of Time? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I guess I, I was kind of an OG uh, amongst us in terms of uh, when I read this, because uh, I, I distinctly remember going into the B. Dalton where my sister worked and seeing the display of eye of the world in paperback so i I, you know i I missed hardcover if they actually had a hardcover of it i don't know um but uh i I just i still remember like you know walking in and seeing it and it's like oh whoa what's that you know and and um so uh so i read it and i was very excited about it initially and um i uh I eventually started to uh, kind of resent the series a little bit because um, around this time I started to have like this real uh, uh, renaissance of, of of my imagination where I, I was like de- de- just devouring books left and right. And like, you know, uh, if I didn't read a whole book in a day, like I've done something wrong with my day. <laughs> um, and, you know, so anyway, it got to the point where I was like, I still – was curious to find out what happened but then i was also really resentful that how long the books were because it's like well i could read like three or four books in the time it would take me to read one of these um and and i i found that i, I just wasn't as passionate enough to keep going with it and i think I, I so i read all the way through book five and then i started reading book six and i just sort of like gave up at some point um nothing in particular about the series or the book that that did that i think it was just like i was interested in exploring more different things rather than uh you know sticking with that um i also did have some sort of um i felt like i had peer pressure from my uh dnd group who uh seemed like i i believe they all really liked it um and so like i i had had that pressure from them to be like to keep reading it so that i could talk to them about it you know but uh, that's 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 where I got to in the series, and so because of that, like I too, I, I I wasn't like so excited about the adaptation because I loved the books uh, per se. I mean, I, I I don't I have some fond memories of reading them, but um, you know, I I was a little skeptical for that reason too because it was like, well, you know, I don't know, but we'll see, you know. Right, but but these books are like even even if John and I didn't didn't super get into them, I mean, they're super popular. I mm-hmm. mean. 
I'll tell you a little bit of the history as I understand it. I mean, basically, um, you know, the Lord of the Rings books were really popular. And then Lester Del Rey, uh, who was a, you know, an editor was like, I need another, uh, something like Lord of the Rings. I think that would really sell because people are just reading their copies of Lord of the Rings over and over again. And there's nothing else like that really on the market. And so he came up with, you know, he, um, discovered Terry Brooks and the Sword of Shannara, which is, you know, very, very much like, um, Lord of the Rings. And then that, became a New York Times bestseller. And then that sort of opened the floodgates where lots and lots of authors were were doing something, you know, books in the style of, of Lord of the Rings. And um and so Wheel of Time was was another one of these things. So the first book I think came out in nineteen ninety. And um uh and and yeah, I mean does seem to me pretty heavily influenced by by Lord of the Rings. Uh so you 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 guys who are big fans of these books can tell me if you think this is fair. But particularly watching the the show again, it was kind of reminding me that like this does seem kind of like Lord of the Rings plus Dune, right? Like mm. there's the um basically the world from Lord of the Rings, you know, the the geography kind of, you know, that kind of world. And then the Aes Sedai seem like you have this 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 order of of female wizards called the Aes Sedai who seem a lot like the Bene Gesserit. And then there's this prophecy about the dragon who's going to potentially destroy the world or save it, who's the the, the male, the, the the man who who gets his hands on the magic that the the women have been using, who's kind of like the Kwisatz Haderach from, from Dune. So I'll start not, off with and that. Not, not an actual dragon, should be noted. <laughs> Just yeah, yeah that's, act, that's actually a good point. Yeah, so this the, the dragon, quote unquote, is a, is a human being. Uh, of immense magical power in this world, not not a winged reptile kind of thing. Um, but so, so, so Abby, just right off the bat, do do you feel like that's a fair uh, critique of Eye of the World? That it sort of seems just kind of like a mashup of Lord of the Rings and Dune. Yeah, um, I think that's a that's somewhat fair. Um, I think he did that to get his foot in the door because the series kind of departs from that in books two and later. So you think he just wanted something familiar for people to get people into it. And then once mm. people are sort of uh, hooked, yeah. then then he, he can take it in some other direction. That's what it seemed like even at the time I read it when I was mm. like age 20. Yep. Mm-hmm. That, that actually kind of explains why maybe Abby and Doug both weren't as hot on the book to start with. But then it sort of picked up or or at least Doug definitely you know, it's like, oh, well, like page 100 is when they started liking it. So, you know, maybe it's like the first part of it was too familiar. Well, it's funny, actually, because I remember reading in an interview with Robert Jordan that he said that he very deliberately started off Eye of the World in Emmons Field by trying to mimic the opening of Lord of the Rings. Oh. And uh, believe it or not, I – well, I love the Lord of the Rings movies. I'm sure this is blasphemous to a lot of people. Hmm. I am not a big fan – of the Lord of the Rings novels at all with uh, the asterisk that I think it's one of the best endings ever to an epic fantasy series. But, you know, it's I would... The, it's one of the only endings ever to an <laughs> epic fantasy series. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Cute, Dave. But you know, it doesn't surprise me then <laughs> that if he was trying to mimic Lord of the Rings early, that I didn't like it early because... One of the things that bothered me about Lord of the Rings was it felt really slow. And those first hundred pages were so slow. It was like wading through molasses. Hmm. If I had anything else to do that day, I never would have read Wheel of Time. You wouldn't be talking to me right now. Hmm. Um, but I do see the similarities uh, you know, between Lord of the Rings and Wheel of Time. Obviously, there are a lot of differences, but you know, the, the template is there and – Dave, I agree with you what you said about Dune also. There are some other similarities I could go into, but you said you don't want us talking about later books and dropping spoilers. But there are some other significant similarities that I've noticed. Mm. I would say yeah, – don't, don't say what they are, but you're saying that there are other similarities to Dune that come up correct. in the series. Okay. So I, I would say like the two biggest obvious influences within speculative fiction on Wheel of Time – our Lord of the Rings and Dune. Yeah, I guess let me just set up what what the story is about. So, so, so basically, we're in this place called. We start off in this sort of small, remote village called the Two Rivers, and there's this group of sort of young people who have all grown up together as friends, 
and then um the town gets attacked by trollocs which are like you know troll like troll troll or orc like monsters and the um and these young people have to flee the village with the aid of a, a wizard named moraine and a, and her sort of warrior companion named lan and um and that's kind of how things um kick off um and so i you know so so going into this show i mean like i said i had pretty low expectations but i actually found the first two episodes pretty engaging i mean you know i thought they did a i, I kind of liked all the actors and um i thought you know i had a sense that of this um village and these people had all grown up together and um and and you know, it, was, it was i thought pretty enjoyable and then the um then the trollic attack was was pretty cool i think that's in sort of toward the end of um episode 2 i thought the special effects were good i thought it was exciting so um so i had a pretty positive impression of the show uh initially um and so so Doug so d- what do you think about that what did you i mean you said in the book you really liked the trollic attack like what did you think of those first two episodes of the show I mean, maybe it's because I was such a f- hardcore fan of the early books. I had very specific notions in my mind. To this day, there are, there's a lot of imagery from those books that are just burned into me. And I'm very particular in like how I remember certain characters and things like that. So I don't have too much that's nice to say about the Amazon series. I do think like the settings were excellent. Um, like Emmons Field, where the you know, the main characters live, that looked like Emmons Field to me. I thought they nailed that. Uh, so like the settings, the scenery, great. Uh, the props, great. The costuming, not too bad. And but I really don't think much of the writing. I don't think much of the acting. Um, I understand that changes happen from a, when you translate one medium into another, but I don't think that they did the best possible job with translating the books to the show. I, I realize it's a monumental task given the scope and the length of the books and the length of the series also, but you know, just I said that I finished the series, even though I wasn't that big of a fan by the end. And in general, these days, I feel like bad TV shows, bad books, life is too short to waste on it. So if I don't like it, I will turn it off. I will stop reading. And Wheel of Time was like my one exception to that rule throughout. You know, I said I loved these books for so long. I have to get to the last book. I have to get to the last battle, which I think they do mention in season one. I have to read that. And I just kept going. There were times I gritted my teeth just hating the books. I'm like, I don't care. I will get to the end. And that's kind of how I felt watching the show. It's like I have that same need to watch it, even though I don't like it. Hmm. And there's Uh, nothing else that does that to me. (laughs) Yeah, but but I mean, I, I definitely understand. I hear where you're coming from on the like, I these books were formative for me, and it's really hard for me to enjoy an adaptation because it's not matching how I imagined it. I mean, that that was totally the situation for me with Game of Thrones, where I you know I, I still haven't even watched the whole show. I, I just have so many problems with mm. um, with it not matching how I you know not not meeting my standards for how I think it should be written or or what or anything. Mm -hmm. um so i I definitely i i I understand that but 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 at the same time i mean if you're if you're into uh the epic fantasy genre and you want to watch a tv show or a movie in that genre like i feel like this is i mean there there are so few examples to begin with that are any good and i feel like this is you know uh pretty good you know compared to what else it might not be you know it might not be what match what you wanted you know from the books mm-hmm. but compared to what else is out there right you've got like the lord of the rings movies and you've got like game of thrones on tv and i don't know even what else mm-hmm. <laughs> comes to mind particularly but i feel like this is sort of you know it's not as good as those but it's uh you know it's pretty 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 reasonable uh given mm-hmm. what else what other epic fantasy stuff you could be watching on tv but um but so abby what do you think what do you think about 
what I'm saying there. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm, hol- I'm holding in my rage going, it could have been so much better. Uh, <laughs> it could have been. I mean, it could have been Game of Thrones. It could have been Game of Thrones seasons one through five. Instead, it was Game of Thrones season eight. Um, <laughs> to me, it was it was kind of abysmal. Mm. Um, and I honestly don't even think they did a very good job with the costuming or the setting. I mean, I... I th- it, to me, it looked like a high school theater production almost. I mean, I, like some of the sets of like cardboard. Are so, you, wait, I mean, this this looked like they spent a lot of money on it. You don't, you they don't, did. They spent a lot of money. I don't know where it all went. <laughs> I don't know. I, I thought the visuals were, I mean, for a TV show, I, I thought the visuals looked pretty good. I mean, like, granted that it's not a feature film, but I mean, for a TV show, it, it seems like, I don't know. It didn't look like like a high school production. It didn't look like Game me. of Thrones. I mean, um, to me, like, like the costumes looked like they bought it at a Ren fair. So, I mean, I, I mean, I guess, you know, to each their own, like everybody is seeing different things. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe there is some quality there that I'm not seeing. Um, but there were definitely parts where I just thought, wow, like that, that looks like they went the cheapest route possible. And I was wondering where the budget went. Hmm. Hmm. Um, but so, so Doug was saying like they, they nailed Emmons field that that's exactly how he imagined it. You're saying that it, no. it was something you imagined <laughs> something much different, Abby. Yeah. I mean, to me, like, you know, this is a poor little backwater of a town. They had like this kind of Tudor style in that's just hopping. It looks like a real swinging place. And I'm like, that's, that was, you know, that wasn't what it was. It just, it you looks wanted, like you like wanted anything. to like, like more grimy or. Yeah, shabby it, or something. I felt like everyone looked like they were fresh out of a spa, um, you know. And that's not what—that's not the vibe that the books had. Uh, so, so nothing, nothing, <laughs> uh, it really appealed to you about the the first two episodes at all. No, I ended up. I was kind of hate watching. I, mm-hmm. I had my husband and some friends that had also read the books, and we were all just kind of making fun of it. Um, and that's kind of how it went for the whole season. Hmm. Um, that's going to make it pretty hard to enjoy the show though. Right. If you're, <laughs> Oh, I was like leading mystery with science theater 3000. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, but we were all on the same page and definitely, I mean, I was, I was with, I was a hundred percent with that. You know, I'm, I probably was taking more seriously than I, they were because I am a writer. My friends aren't. Mm. So but what do you think about my point that like are there other epic fantasy things that you think are better than this on TV or movies? Um honestly even that that show Shadow and Bone I thought did a better job. Um you know the adaptation of Shannara that was it looked all right at least. Um <laughs> it doesn't look like it was super low budget to me at least. So, I mean, yeah, you're right, though. There aren't a whole lot to choose from. To me, this was the writing level was at Season Thrones Game of Eight. I mean, <laughs> Game of Thrones <laughs> Season Eight. Um, yeah, so. And yeah, the, the actual sets and all that was sort of like Legend of the Seeker level. It was it looked low budget. It looked um, kind of like Xena, Xena, Warrior Princess. I mean, which, OK, like that was a popular show in its day. Um but it didn't take itself seriously, and that's what made it fun. And this took itself seriously, and it still looked like Xena. Hmm. I actually, I never saw that Shannara show. So you, uh, you're that, not missing uh, much, Dave. Yeah. So, 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 Abby, you're saying it's is that that's not worth watching, but it's better than this, or is it worth watching the Shannara show? Um, I watched the first season of that, and I stopped. Um, my husband enjoyed it and kept watching it. <laughs> it's, it's really. Um, I guess it's up to the viewer. Because actually, you know, after I watched this, I watched the, tra- I was like, oh yeah, there's that Shannara show I never watched. And mm-hmm. I went and watched the trailer for season two and it's set in like post-apocalyptic uh, San mm-hmm. Francisco. And I was like, wait, is this, is this what Shannara was? I never made it that far into the books. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it was, it was, this kind of made me curious to to watch that. But all right, but this isn't the Shannara panel. Uh, <laughs> so, so John, uh, what was your uh, initial reaction to the show? Yeah, it's it's really strange to me because it it feels like I watched a different show than than Doug and Abby, because uh, I mean honestly, like I actually love it, uh, and I mean I have no 
you know, particular affinity for the books, you know, so I didn't care about the adaptation part of it. Like I didn't care if they changed things. I was watching it basically as a fresh viewer. Um, but honestly, like, yeah, I, I love it. Um, and like, you know, Christy and I rewatched it together, uh, in, in, you know, preparation for the panel. And it was like, I, I wasn't like, I wasn't bored at all, like rewatching anything. I mean, I feel like episode one maybe wasn't quite as good as I remembered it um, on rewatch. But um, I mean, by the time the Trolloc attack happens, which I actually think happens at the end of episode one, if I'm if unless I'm wrong. But by the time the Trolloc attack happens, like I was so in um, like I actually got emotional watching that scene, which you know, Doug and Abby will probably roll their eyes at given that they don't they were like also the show emotional at all. But, in a yeah, well, yeah, in a different <laughs> yeah, way. Rage. No, but I mean, like, I, I, I found it, like, I was like, oh my god, this is, like, so amazing. And, like, when when uh, Moraine starts doing magic and everything, I was like, that is dope to me. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, it's really interesting to me that there's these such dramatically different uh, opinions. I mean, even before the panel, like I, you know, you're watching it on Amazon and you can see the, the, the title card and it's like, it's got the star rating and it's like, it's got three out of five stars. And I'm like, this show has three out of five stars. I mean, and Abby and Doug are probably like, it should be more like one, you know, <laughs> but, um, but you know, I was like, I, I mean, I actually, I mean, I honestly love it. Um, and, uh, and actually, so cr one interesting data point is Christy, uh, really imprinted it hard on those books. And, uh, it's like what, brought her back to fantasy um and so she like loved those books and even though she was in that in the basically the same boat as abby and doug in that regard um she actually loves the show too and like i mean as much as i am saying that like i got emotional at the trollic scene like she starts weeping at almost every episode at some point because she's like feeling it so much um so uh yeah so it's like it's very strange and, and i mean um, you know, there is a thing where like when you're watching something communally with people and one person has a strong emotional reaction that it kind of washes over onto the another person sometimes where like, you know, you, you sort of, uh, maybe view something more, uh, favorably because, you know, the person you're with loves it. Um, but I mean, I don't, I don't think that's what's happening here because it's like, I, I mean, I'm just watching it as a, you know, as me and I, 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 th I thought it was great. So I'm very confused. Yeah, that's because I was going to speculate. Well, maybe if you don't know the books, this works mm -hmm. for you better than if you do. But then your yeah. your example with Christy sort of cuts against that. Yeah. Um. I mean, this is you mentioned that it was like three stars or whatever on mm -hmm. on Amazon. It is 82 percent, I think, on Rotten Tomatoes. Mm -hmm. So we've you mm -hmm. know, got mm -hmm. reasonably good um, critical response. Yeah. Uh, I would say, actually, though, speaking of the Amazon, like, sort of splash screen, one thing I really like, I mean, it's kind of annoying, like, when you get to the end of the episode and it's got the little pop-ups. Uh, I mean, I guess it depends on what device you're watching it on. I I'm watching it on the Amazon Fire Stick, so maybe, I mean, and I see it. But, like, there's a little pop-up at the bottom left corner, and it's, like, basically, like, a little ad. But, like, it actually puts, like, it, it actually puts, like, you know, the uh, the the first book on there and I'm like oh my god a television show is advertising a book that's related to it that's awesome you know i mean i don't know how many people are going to like go buy the book be like on their while they're watching tv but uh but I, I thought that was really cool um i mean it makes sense for amazon's point of view i guess you know well a they're lot of people did buy the book wait i have mm -hmm. the thing here um, oh okay uh, the first volume in the book series, The Eye of the World, saw a spike in sales that has been attributed to the series release for the week of November 28th, 2021. It was the second most sold book across all formats on Amazon.com. It also made the January 2022 New York Times bestseller list in the mass market fiction category hmm. and was number one on the audio fiction list. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it has brought, you know, has mm -hmm. brought people to the books. Um um, but I'm, yeah, I, I like, but like I said, I thought the first two episodes were, were really pretty enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Um, then the next two episodes I had a little bit more mixed feelings about. So the characters, you know, they, they're sort of, um, they're out in the wilderness. I think they get split up mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. um, and I felt like too many of the conversations were kind of like, like basically feeding backstory or like lore to the, um, to the audience. And I was getting a little bored with them. But then once they get to the um, the White Tower and there's all mm -hmm. this like political uh, infighting and factionalism within the the Aes Sedai, and I thought that was actually really interesting and cool. 
Mm. And um, and from there on, I, I thought the show was pretty good. I mean, like, it's mm-hmm. not... I wouldn't say it was, like, the most amazing show ever, but I yeah. you know if you... Given, like I said, given what's on offer for um, epic fantasy, I, I thought it was mm-hmm. a you know reasonably good example. And and like like Christy, I mean, there were some moments that really worked well mm-hmm. emotionally for me. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would say give it a try if you yeah you know, if you want a epic fantasy show. Uh, I just wanted to add too that um, like uh, uh, like I, I I was also very puzzled by. Uh, Abby's comments about like the production values and stuff because like I thought that all looked really good. Um, I, I mean, I, I actually like the costuming and stuff. Like the way Rand is dressed, like that looks to me like like I mean I haven't like re uh, like looked at the covers again, but it's like that matches sort of the picture I had in my mind of like how he looks standing on the covers of some of the books. Which admittedly I didn't love all the covers, but um, uh, one one disappointment I do have with costuming is that Lan doesn't wear armor. Uh, because like on the on the cover of Eye of the World that I remember seeing, like the original cover where uh you know uh Moraine's on a white horse and he's on a black horse, sort of right behind her. But yeah, I mean he's clearly wearing armor. Um, and you know, I, I always kind of am disappointed when when there's a show that adapts something that where we're like in the sh- in the books they they wear armor and stuff, and then in the, in, in the adaptation everybody just wearing clothes. Um, I mean this show at least does have some people wearing armor, but just Land doesn't. Uh, but I mean, I actually I really like his portrayal. I mean, I think that guy that guy um, the actor is it does a good job with it, and I think like you know I I buy him as like this sort of uh, uh, samurai type that you know is just walking around in his uh, uh, you know without armor. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean. I mean, oh, I, well, I, one 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 question I have about the production values for the uh, for Doug and Abby, and I mean Dave too. I mean, even though I mean you, you liked it, but um, since you guys are super fans and and you know you um, have criti- all these criticisms for the show, like what did you think about the depiction, the visual depiction of the magic? Like, did that strike you as correct at all, or uh, is that just not? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> man, it was terrible. I mean, um, you know, like. Like one of the best things about the books is the magic system. It's like they're weaving, so they have mm-hmm. like fire, you know, like like the elementals, right? Mm-hmm. So they they are weaving, and it literally looks like weaving. Mm-hmm. Um, and they just made this like kind of bland white magic special effect. Mm-hmm. Wait, what? What do you mean? It literally? Could you explain that? That it literally looks like they're weaving. What does that mean? Um, they're like so they have threads that they're weaving, like threads of fire ice. Like it's a sort of like ingredients, um, different threads, and they depending on how they weave them together, tie them in knots, um, you know, almost like Celtic style kind of knots, very intricate. Um, and then so you're saying they should have been like plucking different colored kind of magical threads out of the air and like tying them into different shapes. Yeah. Not, not like literally tying them like with their hands, but using, you know, mm-hmm. hand gestures or whatever to do it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Do you agree with that, Doug? Or what did you want to see in the magic? I thought it would look pretty bland, to be honest. I mean, the first time, okay, just in general, my feeling about magic is like a fireball is probably like the least magical thing you can do. While on the surface, yeah, they're casting fireballs. That's magical. There's no sense of wonder anymore because I've read and seen a million fireballs. And yes, Moiraine does summon fire in the books, but I think Abby kind of summed it up. They, they're they not showing how... Th- it's unique with what they're doing with uh, like magic you've seen before, like, like like a fireball or a wall of fire. It's just, it's just stuff I've seen and a million times before that they really don't get into. Like there's a little bit of explanation, a little bit of chit chat here and there about, you know, uh, the one power and all that. But when the actual execution of the magic itself seemed pretty bland to me and not, not that inspired. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I I I feel like this is sort of a generic world to me. I mean, like, I mean, and and that's I think that's a legitimate criticism that it seems sort of bland and generic. I mean, but that seems to me a legitimate criticism of the first book. I mean, that was my impression when I. Well, when I'd I read- say that I'd say like yes, there there is like a template that's generic, but the way he fills it in. Uh, you know what? The, the best way to put it, I remember there was a review of 
the eye of the world. There were a million of them when they were promoting the book. But one of them, I thought, kind of hit the nail on the head with Robert Jordan and what he had done with these books is they said he clothes old bones with new flesh. And when I'm watching this show, all I see is the old bones. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. But I'm but all the stuff like the um the dark one and the the fades, which seem seem just like the dark riders from Fellowship of the Ring. Mm. Uh you know, the the fairy uh um the uh the Trollocs. <laughs> you know, I mean it it all seems pretty familiar. Mm. The the the, cho- the kind of the chosen one trope. Mm-hmm. Right. I, mean, I, I, mean, it I all would is... agree with that. Um and I thought it was kind of generic in the books as well, but the books were not about that really. They were like a kind of background device almost. It was like a launch pad, like a starting off point. So 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 do you do you, but do you think that the first that you saw that in the first book or do you have to get into the later books to really see what makes the series special? I would say it's even in the first book. Um like the the strength of the series is about the interpersonal character dynamics. That's what it's really about. It's, it's kind of like almost like a soap opera. Um, it's really about the people and the heroes, <laughs> you know, and, and the, the show to me just threw that all away, completely ignored that. Okay. Well, so let me tell you about the characters from the show as I, as I understand them. So you've got Rand, who's sort of your, you know, he, he has a mysterious past and, you know, was is sort of a, an orphan, uh, who was raised by this this old soldier with a cool hair? That was like, that that was one of the very few things I remember from the book. I should say I read this twenty hmm. years ago. Hmm. If I didn't make that clear, so I don't remember the, the details that well at all. But the, I remembered the cool hair and Mark sword that stuck mm-hmm, in my mm-hmm. mind. Uh, but you've got Rand, who's sort of your typical farm boy, you know, with a special destiny kind of hero. Mm-hmm. Then he's got his two friends, Matt and Perrin, uh, and. Um, this reminds me a lot of Mary and Pippin, where one's kind of dependable and one's kind of a fuck up, mm-hmm. except they've switched the they <laughs> switched the names so that Matt is the fuck up and Perrin is the de- the dependable one. Um, and then there's the the girl in town that he's always been in love with, Egwene. Um, and so I don't know as the series goes on, or as the season goes on, there's a little bit of a love triangle between Perrin, um, Rand, and Egwene. Um, but but so what's what's Abby? What's in the books beyond that? Like like what what character dynamics should they have put in that that, that I'm missing from just watching? I mean, the show? I could go on and on. Like that's a long list. <laughs> um, well, what's the top one? Uh, you know, <laughs> let's see. I mean, um, for one thing, I thought they kind of made Rand into kind of a stalker with Egwene, which she's he he they're not. You know, in the books, he, it was never this weird stalkery vibe where he was just really. You know, anyway, so so that was kind of a weird loop to throw in. Um, but as far as like the friendship between Rand and Matt was really strong in the books. I loved it. Um, you know, they the books really the book really the book one really went into that where um, you know, where Rand and Matt were kind of on their own little adventure together where they had no money and they're just playing music for their supper type of thing out in the wilderness. Um, kind of exploring the world and trying to get back in touch with their friends. But it was a much stronger friendship. It was like Matt had a lot of kind of like, you could see the the friendship was strong and it was there and you don't see it in the show at all. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, and Egwene and Perrin as well. um, Perrin is a very protective kind of guardian type of character the show did not show that he seems kind of like this mopey, whiny guy in the show. And, you know, I wouldn't want to hang out with him. Um, hmm. I, I got the feeling that he was protect that he protected people. I thought that came through to me. Um, but uh, yeah. I don't know, John, what do you, what did you, do you, did you, you liked these characters or like, what did you think of the character dynamics? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I liked them. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't feel like it was particularly lacking at all. Like, I mean, um, you know, like, again, I'm not bringing in this, uh, this like love and knowledge of the book. So it's, I, I'm just judging it based on, on, on the show. But I mean, I, I thought it all worked well. I, I didn't feel like Rand was stalkery. I mean, he, uh, it seemed like, you know, I, I would concede that there, there seemed to be like a little bit of a, like an, uh, like uh that he kind of feels like they had more of a commitment that than maybe there actually was or something i'm not sure i mean it 
I kind of went back and forth with that because it's like she she did seem like she was really like committed to him at various points, but and you know I don't know. Anyway, it, it's not something that like bothered me while I was watching the show. Um, and uh, I mean I I really like the way um, like Lan and Moraine interact, and I, I like all the stuff with like Lan and um, uh, Nynaeve, and you know. Uh, I don't know. It all it all worked for me, and I I really like all the acting too. I mean, um, you know, I, I don't really have any uh, complaints with that. Like, uh, uh, actually, Dave, I I don't know how accurate this is, but like, I was looking at Rand, and I'm like, oh, it's like young David Bar Kirtley when he was on the lacrosse team. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> he's a but, handsome guy that Rand. That actor. Yeah. <laughs> <that actor. laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, you know, I mean, I I, I thought all that stuff was good. I mean, um, for one thing I was wondering about for the book experts is I, I was kind of wondering like how much of the plot uh, that happens in the show is, is what happens in book one. Like, is that, did they, do they cover most of the events that happen in the book in, in, in the show or is it like, does it leave out a ton of stuff? Actually, actually let me jump in oh, there. Sure. I'll, I'll say like literally all I remember from the book is I remember, like I said, the, I remember the Trolloc attack. I remember that. And then I remember them going to the haunted city where mm -hmm. they get the haunted, the stupid curse dagger. That, that, <laughs> that, that was the, the thing I remember is how much I hated where they're specifically told, like, don't take anything <laughs> from the city. And they're like, well, I'm sure it won't hurt anything if I take this creepy cursed dagger. And I think that even in, in the book, there's like some like creepy guy there too or something. Mm -hmm. um, and then I don't remember like everything else that happened in the show. I was like, I do not remember this at all. Mm -hmm. uh, until they get to the blight, I sort of remember mm -hmm. there being something about that in the book. But but my impression is that they must have taken stuff from like books two and three or something. Mm -hmm. But my impression is that I, I don't remember almost anything. Mm -hmm. And that just might be my bad memory. So I'm curious. Doug. No, it's not your bad memory. Um, they, they mixed and matched a little bit, but that was actually one of my chief concerns at the end of the first season. It's like, well, they changed this much already. Mm -hmm. And I understand you have to make changes, but if you make this many change, all right, like, let me take Game of Thrones, for example. It's kind of inevitable that we're going to compare the two because they're two huge epic fantasies and they both got translated into TV shows. But like, Dave, you talked about like how you couldn't stand the changes that they made, you know, going on and deeper into the series, but they were very true to the books in the first season, I thought. I mean, mm -hmm. I thought they got about as close as you could in terms of the plot if you're going to translate it from one medium mm -hmm. to another. And well, I thought season. I'll just say season one of Game of Thrones. I thought was pretty good. I didn't. I don't okay. have any problem with that. And probably because the some probably part of the reasons because of what I'm saying, it fell very much in line with the story overall. And I think that's a good thing. Just. Give the audience a chance to ground ground your audience because you really have two audiences with these shows. You have the audience that has read the books, and that's your core audience to start. They're the ones that are going to bring you some immediate viewership on top of everyone else. You know you can count on the people that read and love the books. And then you have everyone else, whether they're fantasy fans, casual viewers, people that are curious, word of mouth, whatever. And you have to cater to both. And if you start making radical changes right from the jump, you're really, I feel like, yes, fine. It's What I'm saying isn't written in stone because John's saying how Christy was a big fan and it works for her. But I feel like you risk alienating half of, like, not literally half, but you risk alienating the part of the audience I'm talking about, which is the, the core readers. If there are because so, I think some core readers like myself, probably like Abby, they really had a problem with some of the plot changes that were made in this book, like the Forsaken, in the last battle in, at the end of the first book. You, you meet three different Forsaken and you meet the, the green man who takes out one of the Forsaken. We only saw one of the Forsaken. Um I guess some of that is streamlining. So yeah. Okay. So, so I don't remember this at all. So, but but just hearing you say this, it sounds to me like like how many actors can they hire? Like mm -hmm. you know, like did we really need? I don't even know what you're talking. Well, about. I thought they have this well, massive budget. So how many actors can they hire with this massive budget? Like Abby said, where's the money going? 
but I mean, like, they, I don't know. Did, I mean, they have to cut out a lot of characters, it seems like, and, you know, and focus on the cast. Yeah, but have. I but I mean, they also we never met Elaine in the first book. We never met <laughs> Gallad. We never met Gowan. So they've, they've cut out a lot of characters. And again, I could point you to Game of Thrones where I don't feel like they cut out that many characters in the first book. And these the lengths of those first books are pretty comparable. The running times are pretty comparable and they both have they're both streaming. So they're not like constrained by running time on like normal television. Right, well, so, Game, so, of Thr- so, Game of Thrones did have two more episodes. All right. But, but aside from stuff that they just cut out, like are, are, is there aside from aside from just cutting stuff out, is there stuff that's in there that was changed? Rather um, from what? Sure. There were relationships that were changed, like uh, uh, Suan, mm-hmm. the uh, head of the White Tower. All of a sudden, I'm not getting into uh, like, oh, uh, OK, she in this we see she has a relationship with Moiraine. Well, mm-hmm. OK. In the books, Moiraine has a relationship uh, that kind of blossoms v- over time with I don't want to give spoilers, but mm-hmm. let's just say uh, it wasn't Someone Suan uh, oh. and it wasn't a woman. And mm-hmm. uh, the same thing can be said for Suan. She had a relationship that blossomed and it wasn't Moiraine and it wasn't a woman. So these are two really big changes as far as I'm concerned. And I'm not casting judgment over the fact that, you know, the writers and the team chose to make uh, this a lesbian relationship instead, but that is a jarring change. And there is a butterfly effect that happens when you do that because these are important characters. And even like the relationship between like Rand and Egwene, I thought they, they, I think they really tried to play it up and the whole love triangle thing that, that was not in the book. There was no love triangle mm-hmm. that you referred to. And they, I don't know, by the end of the first book, as I recall, Abby, tell me if I'm wrong, because I only read the books once. It was a long time ago. But by the end of the first book, Rand and Egwene kind of acknowledged that this was just like a childhood thing that both of us are past now. Yep. And it doesn't really, they were not building toward that throughout mm-hmm. the first season. So you know, like just on a plot by plot point and by a ca- on character relationship points. And Abby was saying how I could see why Abby would have such a problem with this when she feels that the, the a big part of what the appeal is for ga- for Wheel of Time is the interpersonal relationships. They are just changing around these interpersonal relationships willy nilly in some respects. I, I, I guess I guess I'll say, Doug, you're, you're talking about these different audiences. There's like the hardcore mm. book readers and, and so on. And, and one thing. And like I said, I thought this was a pretty good show, but I feel like this is a show that's only really going to appeal to fantasy fans. And I don't see this having like a big breakout potential like Game mm-hmm. of Thrones did, where people just watch the first episode and they're like, I've never, I don't usually watch a show with dragons, but this is like fucking crazy. There's all this mm-hmm. like shit happening. And like, you got to like tell other people about mm-hmm. it. So um, I don't know, John, what do you, do you, do you, do you, do you agree with me? This, this is probably only going to appeal to people who would be inclined to watch a show like this to begin with, or do you see this breaking out to like a general audience? Uh, well, just first real quick, I want to address what Doug was saying. I, I, I understand being uh, annoyed with uh, relationship changes, but like the, the relationship with, uh, with the Emerald and Emerald and seed and, and Moraine, like, I, I love that. I thought that was great. That like, that's the kind of change. Like I feel like you do need to make when you adapt something that's older that, you know, this was written in a time when, you know, the author, uh, when Robert Jordan and any author of that era probably wasn't putting any thought into any kind of queer representation in, in the story. And um, so I think like having those kinds of like ma- major characters, having, um, you know, having that not be an issue to them that like, oh, yeah, sure, they can they're, they're going to be in a relationship together. And why should it matter? You know, like, I don't know who the characters were that they would have had relationships with otherwise, you know, that Doug is referring to. But um, I like that kind of change. Um, and uh, sorry. Yeah, just well, to, and, yeah, no, go no, ahead. No, yeah. And I'll just say, I mean, I didn't know it was a change, but it yeah. seemed like an interesting relationship to me. I mean, yeah. I, I thought it was enjoyable. It was alluded but... to in, in the books, like like as a past tense, like they had had mm-hmm, a relationship mm-hmm. when they were kind of in their college dorms type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and and just uh, on the on the similar subject, I, I I would say like one criticism I have um, isn't uh, particularly of the show. I mean, it's just because of the uh, the source material in general. But um, and 
like, you know, the whole thing kind of seems sort of gender essentialist in a way, you know, because it's like, um, you know, obviously women can do this thing and men can't do this thing or, you know, it's like it's all it's all really gender oriented, um, which is interesting in a lot of ways. And I mean, I mean I'm sure like uh, back in the day, it, it was very progressive for, you know, having these uh, women characters who uh, are really, you know, like they're they're amazing wizards and men can't be amazing wizards because they, they can't handle it, you know? So, I mean, it, it was like, it was very progressive in that way. But then like, when you look at it in the lens of now, it's like, well, why is it so focused on our junk? You know, like whether the power, where, whether you can handle the power and it's like, you know, where, where are non-binary people or trans people like in this world? I mean, obviously I know it's like, okay, well, it's complicated to integrate uh, that kind of thing into um, fantasy settings, but because, because it has these lines of gender, it, it does make it sort of like, yeah, well, okay. Uh, you know, it's like, we're just not going to talk about that or think about that, I guess. So uh, given there are those complications, I feel like, okay, well, the very least they could do is, you know, have us have this, you know, important, uh, important uh, relationship in the show being a gay relationship. Um, so anyway, that's that's a, that's an aside, but I, I felt like I, I just had to reply to that. Um, Dave, what what was your question that you yeah, actually that, that, asked me? Do, do you think this has a breakout potential? Oh yeah, um, I mean I think it could. I, I mean certainly not as much as Game of Thrones did, um, but yeah, no, I mean I think generally most most people that are going to watch this are going to be people who um, uh, are are fantasy fans, although. Uh, the fact that Game of Thrones does exist does suggest that a lot of those people may potentially now watch this show where they may not have tried it otherwise. Um, so I guess, you know, it might have some potential for that reason. But um, given that um, it does only have three out of five stars on Amazon, I think a lot of people, it, they'll be skeptical of it for that reason. Um, but then also, um, you know, if you have uh, a lot of the hardcore book fans who clearly don't like it or whatever like like these two um you know that that'll probably put off other people as well like if they just hear you know people talking about it or whatever um you know you're at the office and somebody's a big fan and they're like oh that show's terrible you know so it's like it's not it's not it's not gonna it's not like the dark friends they're ever (laughs) yeah 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 uh but yeah so so yeah i don't know it's uh it does seem harder to imagine um but uh but yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know. I mean, um, has has like The Witcher been a breakout uh, hit outside of fantasy people? I, I feel like it was really popular when that first came out. And I think um, it has. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. my impression is it has. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, if that can, I don't I don't know why, um, you know, any other fantasy show can't. Um, I mean, uh, I, 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 I never read The Witcher books, but I mean, I, I do really like that show. Um and uh, so, I mean, if something like that can, I mean, that's that's just as fantastical as anything. I mean, you know, he's a guy that fights monsters all the time, you know, I mean, it's like, uh, but yeah, well, I, I don't want to get yeah. Abby in here, but I, I'll just I don't think it's because it's fantasy that it's only yeah. going to appeal to fantasy fans. I just think it's like mm-hmm. there's not anything special enough about it. Oh, like mm-hmm. it's like exactly. enjoyable, but it's not like yeah. the, th- the kind of thing that you like have to tell everyone about mm-hmm. after you watch it yeah. but um but abby do you want to respond to just like anything <laughs> anything we've yeah. talked about there? <laughs> yeah i mean i think it had potential it had the potential if they had followed the source material instead of writing their own kind of idiotic story and <laughs> getting rid of all the cool character interaction they literally got rid of like every scene that i thought was good in the book in the first book um, or deleted it and they replaced like, could, it. Could you give an ex- like what's an example of a character's moment in the book that they cut out? Um, okay, like the f- well, you know, a really obvious one is Rand meeting Elaine, which I mean, that's one of the best scenes. Like him meeting Elaine and and then Aleda, um, is a chilling moment where that's when I I probably started to really get hooked on the series. Okay, um, and these are characters who are not in the show at all. Nope, right? not at all. So so what happens in the in the like what's what's so chilling about it? <laughs> um it's when like like until that point Rand isn't really sure that he is the dragon reborn, you know, there's a lot of questions in the air about whether he can channel or not. And he accidentally falls into a princess's garden. <laughs> the princess is like, you know, oh, what a strange coincidence and she brings him to the queen and the queen has an Aes Sedai advisor who's Aleda. She's kind of evil and she's just sitting there knitting and she looks at Rand and she you can just tell she sees something 
just like she saw with Logan. She's like, there's, you know, she's just staring at him. She's like, I want to detain him. She's like, let's put him in, in the prison type of thing. And Elaine is like, no, you know, he, he's just an innocent boy who fell in the garden. And she just kind of protects him. And, um, and it's this really sweet scene where it just sets up so much. And it shows that, that the I said, I have their eye on Rand and that he's going to be in major trouble. Um, you know, with this very powerful organization after him and that Maureen isn't the only person in the organization that's interested in him. And some of them might have bad intentions towards him. Like it, it just sets up like this whole intricate web work. Uh, well, so, so like I was saying, I don't remember like all the stuff from the show about the white tower, the, 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 the false dragon guy that they've captured at Logan. I think that's who you're talking about. Um, yeah. Like, I don't remember any of that stuff in the book. So is that from future books or, no, Did it, just it make never. It up or? Yeah, well, okay. Some of it happened off screen in the books. Like, you know, the books kind of it. It was told like in a sentence somewhere, um, and it happened previous to the first book starting. Um, but yeah, most of it they made up. They made up the whole thing with Stepan, the crying ward warder. That mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like like what was that? They spent <laughs> forty minutes on this this storyline that to me was quite boring. Mm -hmm. and and why would you waste that when you only have eight episodes hmm. yeah uh one question i have uh regarding stuff that happens in the show versus the books is um in the last episode there's that uh there's that big flashback to like a long time ago and and at the end of the flashback we see like you know that the world has like you know flying vehicles and it looks very like sort of futuristic and stuff i mean is that in the book at all yes it is and it that is. was okay. yeah that, that one second of footage i was like oh they actually put mm -hmm. a, some effort into that probably the vfx team had read the books and were mm -hmm. having a blast doing that yeah so where does that come in is that in actually the first book I, I didn't remember that at all um it's it's told in the fifth book um oh okay yeah uh, i i, I want to say by the way just like uh w the, when the the opening when in the first episode when when there's the voiceover reading the 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 you know the first lines of the book about talking about the wheel of time and everything and then uh, if i recall correctly at the end of at, at the last episode uh in episode 8 at the end of it they 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 sort of reprise that and uh you know again return to that um some of that language but um i i just love i just love that like that kind of stuff like gave me chills and everything um with the show but of course i was totally into it so um but uh, yeah, and to yeah. me, it got more interest, more interesting as the season one went on, and yeah, mm -hmm. and you find out, yeah, that this used to be sort of the science fiction world before it mm -hmm. was broken, and then the you meet the dark one, and he's kind of dressed more like a mm -hmm. sort of modern, modernish kind of clothes and stuff, yeah. and it sort of yeah, like it wasn't. I was expecting it to be more generic fantasy mm -hmm. than than it turned out to be as it as the season went mm -hmm. on, or particularly toward the end there. Uh, I will say, speaking of the Dark One's outfit, I, I did not care for that. That was one piece of costuming I, I, I couldn't get behind. Um, he kind of looked like a waiter to me. Right. Uh, and I was like, why does he look like a waiter? Uh, I just but... I just don't like tucking in my shirt. So. <laughs> yeah. So he was um, really, I he was really, he's like, definitely doesn't tuck in his shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's never seen Queer Eye and, and had the lesson to do the French tuck. You know, like, you're doing <laughs> it all wrong, man. You got to leave the back untucked. You, you tuck it in <laughs> in the front. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I didn't like his outfit at all, but, um, I thought the actor was pretty interesting. I thought he did, you know, I mean, I don't know. It's like, that's a hard role to step into. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, what about when, uh, before, before we actually see the dark one's face, like as a person, uh, and we see like the sort of special effects version of his face, like, is that, is there any like description of what the dark one looks like in the books that like you could compare that to? Like, I mean, is that like something that was also like infuriating you guys or? <laughs> well, Rand was experiencing these dreams in the book as mm -hmm. well. And he would see a man that, you know, they thought it was a dark one that I believe there was flame in his eyes and his mouth. So they, they were using that, mm -hmm. uh, I guess accurately, even though I pictured it differently, it's like, fine, this is how they're presenting it. Mm -hmm. But didn't they establish by the end of the that episode this wasn't the dark one he was seeing? But or am I misremembering? Uh, well, I'm sure that they didn't do a very good job of it. If they, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean that guy was supposed to be, I think, Ishmael, which is one of the Forsaken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wait, so he? No, I, I thought he was the dark. I thought he was yeah. the dark one. 
So, well, I mean, I, yeah. And I mean, I think, um, I think that's the impression that they wanted to leave the viewer with. Um, even though like, you know, we don't know Rand wouldn't know, uh, uh, although it kind of seemed like Moraine well, thought that he was, but I don't know if she would have known that he wasn't. Well, cause it seems so much like it was like Satan tempting Jesus. Yeah, in the desert. Yeah. It was like that kind of, so that, so it just made that connection yeah. that he, this is like Satan, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I did think the blight was pretty cool, just visually, like how they mm-hmm. depicted it all the I did like the way they depicted the blight. That was uh <laughs> Okay, there we go. We got one thing. Hmm. Did Doug Doug liked a couple of things. He also liked he also looked like the way Emmons Field looked, you know. Okay, that's that's right. <laughs> it's just some of like the, the plot choices that they made, it just like Abby gave a great example. It's like you have all this source material. And you're just trying to establish the world, and you're going to waste a whole episode on a weepy warder who's not real, who ki- kills himself at the end. Really? And you're going to cut all this other stuff that is mm-hmm. awesome that we don't even get to see. Because why? You know yeah. better? <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I, I can see that. Like, as a fan, it's like you don't wanna, you want to see all these different things depicted, and it's like that's something that's just not even in the books, and it didn't have any particular – necessity to be in there um but is that in the books though that the warders like you know that that would happen that they would be really upset if they're mm-hmm. isolated yes died? if if they feel the because they have this link and if it's severed yeah. it's very hard for them to go on mm-hmm. and they, they do get into that uh, without dropping spoilers but they didn't need to get into that then with the yeah. in, with this example so, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe it was a bit of a heavy-handed uh, sort of visualization of that idea, you know. Like, whereas, like, they could have they could have made it more clear, or they could have made it clear without that whole scene, you know, that whole character um, being added and following all that story. But uh, yeah. I just yeah. I just feel like like having watched or heard heard George R. R. Martin talk about the Game of Thrones mm-hmm. adaptation, and like, mm-hmm. even though it's like an HBO show with this huge budget and stuff, there's mm-hmm. like so many ridiculous constraints that they're under. Where yeah. You know, like there's like so many scenes where they're not riding horses, and he's like, "Yeah, we'd already blown our horse budget." So like everyone's <laughs> yeah. just walking in the scene, and if, you know, if you can't even afford horses, you know, like yeah, yeah, yeah. There's just like you know, I, I think to a certain extent, you have your cast, and you have to like do what you can with the cast rather than bringing in mm-hmm. other actors. But I also I, I heard there was a, a you know this they were trying to film this right as the pandemic was like, yeah. at its worst, and apparently a lot of that that like screwed up a lot of stuff where. Mm-hmm. I, I read something or heard something about the last episode where like they had to like completely throw out the script and just write a completely new script. Because, oh, geez. Like, like with the actors that they could get, mm-hmm. you know. To, oh, and that was so to... obvious. Yeah. When the, at the very end of that episode, we're all screaming, Matt, Matt. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, obviously oh. they ran out of Matt. to film. Hmm. So. <laughs> Speaking of the pandemic and Matt, that reminds me a couple of weeks ago, I cannot speak to the veracity of it, but I actually – read an article about Matt and it, mm-hmm. uh, the actor who played Matt. Uh, maybe you guys know that it's a different actor next season. Yeah. 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 Do you, do, um, did you, do you, do we know why? Well, the article I read claims that this was like a whole vaccination thing and that that actor refused to get vaccinated and that led to his exit from the show. Well, hmm. I, agree with that wholeheartedly if that's the case jeez what the hell well without getting political i just thought it was something interesting to share if we're discussing this Wait, yeah, do we, yeah. Do we, I, I just don't want to put that out there unless that's like confirmed. oh yeah well yeah, i yeah. mean that's why i'm not saying this as gospel i mean people can i don't remember where the article was i read an article i'm sure if people want to google they could find this article or maybe another article and make the decision for themselves so i'm not reporting this as hard news everyone but but yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I, I, that's just another thing is there was the pandemic and yeah. kind of like fucked up a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a shame. It's a shame. I mean, that, I thought that actor did a good job with Matt. I mean, I thought um, he was terrific. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he was one uh, of the few I, I really thought was a good actor. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so you Sorry. you guys you guys didn't like Rosamund Pike as Moraine? Like I I thought she felt perfect oh, to me. I actually didn't. Yeah, I was I was huh. hoping I would, but. Part of it is is the material she had to work with. I think a lot of this could be attributed to the writing mm-hmm. and not not to the actual actors. I agree with Abby on that. Hmm. I thought oh, wow. she was fantastic. I mean, I obviously I have no um, yeah. 
I don't care. <laughs> like, or, you know, I mean, but I, I think she's a fantastic actress and I, mm-hmm. I thought she was so good in this. I mean, yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I thought she was, yeah, like, like probably her and Matt were my two favorite actors. Yeah. I thought the, the guy that played land did a damn good mm-hmm. job of depicting land based on the, the mm-hmm. script that he had to work with. But yeah. Matt, I, I didn't like Matt. Like I didn't, I think mm-hmm. the actor did fine with the scripts he had. I think this came back mm-hmm. to the script. I, like reading the books. I remember Matt as like a lot more of a, Yes, he had to struggle with this darkness from the dagger, but there was something like of a bounce to his step, like uh, some, something like he's like a rogue, but he's a charming rogue. And mm-hmm. I, he just – this match seems so whiny and miserable yeah. all the mm-hmm. time. Yes, he had this mistrust in the books, but it didn't dominate him to the fact, mm-hmm. to the point where he was just like you know, snarling at everyone. I felt like mm-hmm. that was lost. Uh, but again, I think that was more about the scripts. Okay, but what, what about what about the Gleeman, Tom Tom Merrill? Oh, that was like, so terrible. No, they made him a jerk. <laughs> yeah, they, they made him into this like all. thieving, like depressed, morose, horrible person. Yeah. I mean, what? I don't know what he was like in the book, but I loved him. I loved him on nice, the show. He was a nice grandfatherly figure who was watching yeah. out for them right from the beginning. He seems yeah. much more interesting in the way they put him in the show. <laughs> than the, but he's than... not. He's not likable. I don't yeah. like him in the show. Oh, I, I really liked him. I thought he was cool. Um, does he also in the in the books? Does he also basically sacrifice himself to save them? Like when yeah. there's some kind that, of Stark friend attack or whatever. Yeah, that, he does that. that. that he does there is, that. Yeah, yeah, you know, they made changes, but that that is yeah. accurate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but he doesn't steal from them or insult them. Yeah, <laughs> none of that. Yeah, no. I mean, like that's just like fun. That's something fundamental about his character. It, it says like mm-hmm. they're they're presenting him as a very different person. As far as I'm concerned, I didn't like it at all. Yeah. Uh, so as far as um, as far as like Trollocs goes, uh, what how accurate do you feel like they were representing Trollocs? Like, I don't I don't really remember them that well, but like my recollection was that they were kind of like, you know, sort of part animal, part, you know, man, part and, you know, and like all BCL and like so these things kind of do look that way, but. They kind of look similar. They all kind of look similar to me. Whereas, like, I felt like there was like sort of pig trollics and you know, like whatever different kinds of animal trollics. There's, there's like goat man trollic, whatever. Like, is that is that what it was like in the books, or how was it? Yeah, they looked um, a little bit better in the books. I thought they were different like that. But I wasn't really the. To me, the books were never really about the trollics. Yeah, and also I'll say in the show they made the trollics kind of wimp out and seem real pathetic. We're on episode four. Um, they were chasing them into Shadow Logos, and then they just kind of vanished and never show up again. Mm. And it, it, the show never explained why. So, wait, so in the book, they're not afraid to go into the haunted city. Oh, they got driven into the haunted city in the books. Um, yeah, the, and, the Trollocs uh, did. Yes. Oh, they did. okay. Wait, so why did they go in the book? Why did they go into the haunted city? The characters. The, oh, the the hero characters. Yeah. Mean? Um, yeah, because they're being hunted by Trollocs. So th- that's like the best place Maureen could think to, mm-hmm. to hide them, basically, even though it's a cursed city. But the Trollocs will still go into it? In the well, book. she thought that they wouldn't, but then they end up oh. getting driven in there and hunting them. And um, that's when they all get separated in the books, oh, okay. as well as in the show. Yeah. But in the like, show, they never explain why the Trollocs, you know, mm-hmm. wh- what happened to them. They just apparently yeah. just give up. When you say they get driven in like the... The fades like whip them to get them to go in or something. Right, or, right, okay. mm-hmm. yeah. And so, yeah. Speaking of the fades, like uh, how how are they described in the books? Uh, I assume you guys also hated them in the show. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't have a problem with uh, the way the fades were de- depicted in the show. If that makes you feel better, <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll agree with that. Like to me, again, like like it's not about the fades and the trollocs, and they, right. they did their best. I I, I knew those were going to look a little hokey. Right. Yeah, and I mean, you know. Not nobody's nobody's saying that 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 the that the that the books or the show are about any of these things. It's just you know I'm just curious, like you know, since you guys have so many issues with the adaptation, I'm just like, well, how did they do in this aspect of it? You know, like does that like is that how they're supposed to look? That like that's the kind of stuff I'm really curious about because when I watch the show and I like it, I'm I'm wondering like, oh, is this what it was like in the books? I don't know, you know, and so. um you know, that's one of the things that I thought like you guys could uh, contribute that isn't vitriol. 
<laughs> Sorry. Actually, let me let me ask. I mean, this is one of the things that I this was one of my the biggest problems I had, and maybe there's some explanation for this. But it seems like Moraine takes all these people who, and she's not sure which of them is the dragon or not. And then there's this bartender, and like um, Rand just kind of like wanders down to the bar, and the bartender's like, "Oh, I'm a seer, and like you're the dragon." <laughs> right. And he's like, "Oh, no," and he's like, "Oh, I'm the dragon." And, and it's like, why didn't she take them to the bartender like the first thing in the? When they first arrived in the city, that seemed really, really strange to me. It's so clumsy. That's that's what that's the clumsy rewriting that they did. I mean, you know, yeah, like like she Min meets Rand in the books, but she doesn't tell him he's the dragon. You know, she meets him much earlier. She gives him some like creepy kind of like, oh, you know, I see this in your future. Um, and then they meet again in later books. But um, I don't know that the show just decided to rewrite all of that and make it like this weird montage you're the dragon you're the dragon like a weird montage about it i i thought there was like lazy writing top to bottom like at one point like land says to moiraine oh, where to now and she says there were rumors of like three tavirin in like the two rivers it's like and then later on in the show they emphasize how rare it is to for like one tavirin let alone three so if it's that rare and you're hearing rumors of three why Why didn't you hustle over there ages ago? And where are these rumors coming from in this secluded little village where these people have never left the village? It's like... And wait, sorry. What's a Taviran is like a candidate who might be... The, oh, I'm right? sorry. Yeah, the Taviran, they're basically... The Taviran are basically in Robert Jordan's world. Uh, uh, people that they basically like... Re- without meaning to. They're, they're, they're so... Like their destiny basically is so powerful, like they can rearrange like the the pattern of the world around them, and they influence events because of like how how meaningful like their life is going to be. Because the wheel, you know, the wheel knows what's coming because it's the wheel of time, and they're going to be influencers within the wheel. And here you have three Taviran in one village, which is like, oh, it's a small village. This is unheard of. And it's like, what now? Well, there's rumors of this. It seems like if you heard rumors of that, you would have been on the ball looking for that ages ago if you've been looking for 20 years, like you said. And where are these rumors coming from? Because the only thing that is like from the outside world that has any inkling before you mention that rumor are some dark friends like Peyton Fane, who has like been keeping an eye on things there. So unless like part of Moiraine's spy network is dark friends, how are you hearing these rumors? quote-unquote rumors it's just lazy writing there were multiple problems like that with moraine yeah like like she seemed like by the end i thought she just seemed like an idiot like she seems like somebody and and of course her character is not supposed to be an idiot she's supposed to be pretty capable yeah pretty sharp on the ball wise clued in all right well let let me ask this i i I have another note here this is my other sort of problem i want to ask about it's okay so they meet these um uh, this group of people, they're called like the Tinkers or something. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, who teach them, or, uh, teach parents the way, of the, least, the, the way of the leaf, which is basically just pacifism. You never mm-hmm. fight back. And I think that um, like nonviolent resistance works really well against humans, mm-hmm. but it seems really weird in a world of metaphysical evil where there's like literally like fades and stuff like that, who I think are just, mm-hmm. they just have evil souls, right? They're, they're just ev- like evil incarnate. Like, why would you not like they have no better nature to appeal to, right? Or there is no like politics involved, right? So, so how would pacifism work against just like demons and like monsters Mm -hmm. like that? Yeah, I mean, the show like doesn't cover anything like that, of course, but like in the books, um, it's like the tinkers just don't usually encounter Trollocs. Like, Trollocs and Fades don't come into the world very often. It's not like they're just constantly raiding villages. It's very, very rare. Um, and the fact that they're suddenly, like, you know, raiding the two rivers is one of the major things that just Right, of, and, like, know. in the books, like, when the Trollocs do raid, it's usually, like, in the north by the Blight, you know, like, uh, but now we find out they have access to, like, these way gates, mm-hmm. or the ways, I think they're called in the show, mm-hmm. which allows them to get to two rivers. But before they had that access, like, in this age, it was like unheard of during this time to see like Trollocs this far south. And mm. I don't think the Tinkers really ever went far enough north mm. where they would run into like Trollocs and Fades. But but so, so this way of the leaf has just sort of developed 
because Fades and Trollocs aren't around. Like it's 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 only humans that they've encountered. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole history to it, and the sh- the books get into the history, and it, it has to do with it has to do with the metaphysical evil. Um, but yeah, pretty much like like for three thousand years, they've been wandering around in only human lands, never having encountered Fades or Trollocs. Hmm. Okay. All right, well, uh, I guess that makes it. yeah. John, yeah. Go ahead. Oh uh, no, no, go ahead. No, I was I was just about to ask you if you wanted to. Oh, okay. So add anything else? Uh, I, I don't have anything to add on that, but I do have a very important question. Were you guys satisfied with the number of times Nine Ave tugs on her braid? Because <laughs> oh, I have important. to say, yeah, because that was that was like one of the things that I actually remembered from the books is that like, oh my god, she's always tugging her braid. Uh, and and I did notice it a couple times in the show. I thought it might become a drinking game, but it, it didn't happen that much. So I don't know. Yeah, uh, they didn't even I, I, do that. <laughs> like, like isn't that terrible? I'm like, like they can't even be bothered to to do that little tiny fan service. I mean, it, and it's a tiny fan service to do. She did do it at least once. I do remember it happening in at least once. If she did it, yeah. I missed it. I will say in the books, it was a little, it was a little much how often she yeah. did it in the books. <laughs> so like, I would have preferred to like see it since it was a character habit. But yeah, I wouldn't, I didn't want to see it f- as frequently as it was in the books because it was like yeah. by book eight, it's like, how does this woman have any hair left? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Well, you know, she uses she, uh, she uses uh, her magic powers to to restore the hair. Is is what? Well, she yeah, she is a healer, so there you yeah. go. Yeah. Oh, so that's a question I have in the books. Is Nynaeve, uh seen as like you know the strongest channeler that they we've seen in a thousand years? Is that is that a thing that they say? Yeah, but they did not lead with that. They didn't reveal that. Like, in <laughs> I don't think it was revealed at all in book one. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, I just I, I didn't remember that part of it. Although, like I said, I mean, I read it so long ago, I don't really remember much. Um, but uh, oh, and then so at the end of uh, the season, when uh, you know the uh, the the channelers at the city that's never fallen are all uh, Faldara when they're when they're 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 trying to stop that horde that's approaching, and they all link up with the you know the 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 Isid- or the, all the channelers link up. Um, it, did, did, did that, does that happen in the book where, where Nynaeve like basically sacrifices herself for Egwene and then Egwene no. brings her back? No? <laughs> no. Oh, that's just... <laughs> it's terrible. Why? Oh, okay. Well, I, I don't know why they did that. Um, because but, they think um, they know better. Right. But but did did that kind of scene happen in the books where like they were linking up as channelers to stop this no, uh, you know, like, invading horde? Part, no? part of the thing of the books is like Aes Sedai training is really intensive. It takes a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, Nynaeve and Egwene have to go to the White Tower and they, they are mm-hmm. apprentices for, I think, three or four books before they really start mm-hmm. to kick ass. Okay. So, so, so that kind of scene, there's nothing like that scene in the books where, where, where there's like this army approaching Feldala, of Trollocs approaching Feldala that has to be fend, fended off. Uh. In, in, in early in the books, I guess. There is at the very end of a book one. Um. Uh-huh. But, you know, spoiler for the book, you know, it's it's Rand who takes care of the army kind of un- almost oh. unconsciously. Yeah. Oh, really? OK. Yeah. Hmm. All right. So we, we need to start wrapping this up. But I, I guess I'm curious. So, like, yeah. who's planning to watch season two? So, <laughs> Abby, are you off the train or are you still planning to watch season two? I might hate watch it with friends. <laughs> Um, I certainly won't be enjoying it. I'll be making fun of it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay, and I, I, ha- I have to say, like, I, I don't know. I just think if you're sitting around with friends making fun of a show, there's like no way you're mm-hmm. gonna like it, no matter how how good it is. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know <laughs> if that's uh, if that's the best approach. But uh, yeah, uh, Doug, are you watching? See, you said, are you gonna? You, you said you're gonna. Is this like like finishing the the books? Or <laughs> you're just gonna like grit? Yeah, I have this. Yourself? They, they, there's this magic you'll they have in Wheel of Time called compulsion. Uh, <laughs> I, I have this strange compulsion to keep watching. Maybe it's a little, it's beyond des- describing uh, beyond what I said before, where it's just like, this is the exception. I will keep watching it, uh, even though I hate it, but I can't make that promise that I will see it through to the end. But I, I'll mm-hmm. I'll probably tune in to start season two, but... Uh, they better start improving this thing. There's no chance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and John, you're definitely watching season two, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, I, 
I, I honestly love it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, it's funny because, you know, I mean, I, I think we initially started like I as soon as I watched it, I emailed you. I'm like, oh, my God, Dave, it's so great. You know, like and this was after like I just watched the first episode and and, and or at least I'd seen the Trolloc attack, which I, you know, whichever episode it's in. Uh, but I was just like, oh, my God, we got to we got to do a panel on this. And then, you know, it didn't happen right away. But uh, yeah. And uh, my opinion didn't change. Once I got to the end of the series uh, of the of the season, I, I I still I still think it's great. So, um, yeah, yeah, and I mean, like I, I like I said, I have an overall fairly positive impression of this show. Although, I mean, I'm definitely not as positive as John. Where I I think that this yeah. is a show like if you're a if you're an epic fantasy fan and you want to watch an epic fantasy show, yeah, I think this is a pretty you know somewhat generic but generally mm-hmm. enjoyable um, example of one. But um, you know, I wouldn't. It's it's not gonna if if you're sort of not into fantasy, I don't think this is the show that that would win you over. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, you know, I'll watch season two. I mean, I like fantasy, and uh, I wish there were more epic fantasy shows. And it seems like you know, like Hollywood is really struggle. I mean, like Game of Thrones was such a cultural phenomenon, mm-hmm. and it seems like everyone has been trying to come up with the next Game of Thrones and not really mm-hmm. succeeding. It seems to me. I think Jeff yeah. Bezos even like gave marching orders where he said, "Find me my Game of Thrones for Amazon mm-hmm. Prime." I think that right. happened, and they ended up getting Wheel of Time. This yeah. could have been they, it. I, I really believe this could mm-hmm. have been if if they had stayed faithful to the source material. Yeah, so I, I don't think this is going to be it, and I don't think the Lord of the Rings prequel thing is going to be it either. Mm-hmm. Um, turns out that yeah, replicating that success is uh, <laughs> pretty difficult. Which makes me curious how House of the Dragon is going to be received. Mm. yeah um i don't know i i feel like yeah we're kind of getting off on a different subject there but i mean i, I feel like i don't i saw someone say recently that you know the game of thrones was such this cultural phenomenon and it seems like people just really i didn't even watch it but that people really disliked the last season and mm-hmm. like that people don't really talk about it, it, seems, it yeah. seems like people yeah. don't really talk about it anymore and yeah I'm not, yeah i mean they it, it definitely went way downhill yeah. Yeah, I feel like like this this adaptation was on that level of season eight mm-hmm. of Game of Thrones, and Game of Thrones was such a good series. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I, I I feel like the House of the Dragon show. I, I, I don't. My prediction is it may may do okay, but I don't think it's going to be a like mm-hmm. a, it's going to bring back the the magic that the Game of Thrones uh, enjoyed. Right. Um, but but we'll see. But yeah, so why don't we uh, wrap things up there? But you know, like I said, I think the show is pretty enjoyable, and I would give it a try and see what you think for yourself. Um, but yeah, so we've been speaking with John Joseph Adams, Douglas Cohen, and Abby Goldsmith. So thanks everyone so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Dave. Always good to be here. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to John Joseph Adams, Douglas Cohen, and Abby Goldsmith for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com geeks, or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com crowdfunding. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkertley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.